You are listening to the Tri Order Transmissions Episode 94. And now, here are Craig and Jeff. Welcome back to the Tricorder Transmissions. This is episode number 94, Gold Key Comics 14, The Enterprise Mutiny. As always, we are your host, Jeff Hewlett. And Craig Cohen. And Jeff, I just want to take a, a minute to say uh, Happy New Year formally. Um, we are now in 2016. It's crazy. Yeah. Happy New Year to you as well. And we will be rapidly approaching our three-year anniversary here in 2016. Amazing. Just amazing. Uh, God, what time a, flies. What a great ride. Yeah, time flies. How much the show has evolved over time. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is fantastic. And you know, Happy New Year as well to all of our listeners. I know we haven't had a show uh, since our Christmas episode that came out on Christmas Day. And uh, that was a really great... Thanks for the response to that show, by the way, out there in listener land. It's been wonderful to hear back from all of you uh, on our Christmas wishes and what we're looking forward to in 2016. And we look forward to all of the great Trek experiences that are kind of come up in this 50th anniversary year. Yeah, it should be a, it should be an exciting, exciting year. Yeah, I'm thinking so. There's so much stuff going on this year, uh, you know, with the, the new show that's coming in the beginning of next year. We got a movie coming out this year. We've got all kinds of cool stuff coming out from CBS and Paramount. And we've got the, the 50th anniversary convention out in las vegas plus creation i know is doing several other cons across the country so this is going to be a great year for trek fans yeah and we've even got some lawsuits <laughs> yeah i know i you know usually the tricorder transmissions doesn't swing into this uh the drama that's going on in trek land but since you brought it up um i, I am sure many of you are aware that the first ever lawsuit uh, from CBS has been filed against a Trek fan film uh, that is Axanar. And we've actually had Alec Peters on the show before yeah. to talk about Axanar. So it kind of hits a little close to home. But I, I don't think that all of the details are currently available. So I'm I'm really not sure where to go with this conversation. Yeah, me, me too. I mean, I think it's way too early to, uh, you know, to uh, to really have a any kind of serious discussion about it, but I know everybody. Uh, I know the, the folks behind it, uh, Alex has put out um, a statement, and um, you know we'll see where things go from here. It's it's you know if nothing else, it's unfortunate for the people behind the scenes on that show who are are you know very passionate, and also all the fans that donated money to to to, to make it happen. Yeah, it's kind of shocking since CBS hasn't, um, Paramount haven't had a reaction to uh, fan films. They've kind of uh, taken a, I don't want to say necessarily a blind eye, but they've they've kind of let people do what they want to do. And uh, this is the first time they've come out and made any sort of a legal stance against it. So I, I'm not quite sure what to make of it since there's a lot, there are a lot of fan productions that have been ongoing for a while that have been uninterrupted and have not been targeted with a lawsuit. So uh, I'm really not sure what to make of this. And there's been a lot of speculation. I've read a few articles of people speculating why this was done, but I think until we see a public release of the legal documents involved here, we're not really going to know for sure what the, the legal claims are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the most interesting thing here is you look at, uh, you know, how fan films in certain instances sort of keep uh, a franchise energized or propped up. And you could you could definitely argue that that's been the case with with Star Trek. So uh, it's yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how this all unfolds. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm going to take right now. I'm going to take the same sort of stance that Alec Peters uh, took. And, and I'm going to hope that we can everybody can come to an equitable solution that works for both parties. Yeah. Yeah, and keep keep both keep keep Axanar alive and and keep CBS whole uh, in their franchise ownership. So we shall see what happens. So 
back to our Gold Key Comics coverage. This is, as I said before, the 14th issue of the Gold Key Comics, and it's entitled The Enterprise Mutiny. Yeah, not that the cover would let you know that. <laughs> yeah, that's weird, isn't it? Yeah, I was when I when I when I picked up the issue, I said, "Is this the first case where there isn't any kind of hint of the title on the cover?" Because I know sometimes the cover title isn't the exact title, mm. but this was the first time I looked at it. And I'm like, "Wow, there's nothing here." Yeah, it was it struck me as odd, and I there's this is the also the first issue. Speaking of cover art, this is the first issue that I found any information about who actually drew the cover. And it's not the artist who did the uh, the drawing for the actual issue itself. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a different guy. So I, I'm wondering if this was somebody new to the series uh, that wasn't maybe quite familiar with the, the past history. The writer, again, as we've had for the last several issues, is Len Wein. The artist is still Alberto Giolitti. But in this issue, the cover art was drawn by a guy named George Wilson. Hmm. So um, I know the last couple of issues we've made uh, specific statements about the covers being actually painted in respect to the issue itself and not just being promotional photos. And so I'm wondering if this guy uncredited was the guy who drew or painted the last couple of issue covers. Yeah, I mean, it would make sense. And I mean, stylistically, it it looks it looks very similar. Yeah, it definitely does. So let's see. Other information. Star date 1841.2. The issue came out in May of 1972. Cover price of 15 cents. And of course, 1841.2 is again sometime in the 2260s, according to our uh, calculations as the star date versus actual Earth dates. So uh, the cover blurb for this comic reads, A monster attack leaves Captain Kirk mentally unfit to command the Enterprise. And once again, you know, we like to keep you guys shielded from spoilers in case you're wanting to read this issue. And we won't talk about anything specific about the issue until we start covering it. But I think this is a significant issue in the fact that is the first issue that has an appearance of a certain famous alien race not that you know by the uh, the way they're drawn uh, yeah i know I, we're gonna get to that near the end of the issue but uh this this to me was very very intriguing uh because we've seen this comic getting closer and closer to the series and i was very very excited uh near the end of this comic when they reveal that this uh, this famous alien race is is part of this issue so if you guys have not read this and you want to read it before you listen to us talk about it, stop the podcast now. Uh, pick up a copy of this issue. It's available online and in the the uh, re-releases of the Gold Key comics that you can pick up at your local bookstore or online in digital form. And we are going to start talking about this issue in three, two, one. So the Enterprise is in orbit around the planet, Beta 2, and the sensors have detected large deposits of valuable ores, and we've seen that happen in prior episodes of the of the TV show, so this is kind of a familiar trope. Uh, Kirk and Spock and a few security guards uh, beam down to the surface to do some surveying, and they don't find any of the ore right away. They decide to split up and take a look around in, in two different groups, Kirk in charge of one group and Spock in charge of the other, which is a little bit different than what we've seen. Usually they kind of stick together, but in the comic, they're splitting up. So they move in different directions to search. Uh, Mr. Scott soon uh, beeps Mr. Spock's communicator to tell them that there's uh, an urgent message that has come in from Starfleet. He's up on the Enterprise, and he's unable to reach Captain Kirk. Spock uh, and his group begin to take a look around for Captain Kirk. They're not able to contact him either, and but they're able to track him using the signal that's coming from his communicator, which is apparently still working. So they come to the top of a, uh, a rocky crag, and they see Captain Kirk laying on the ground, uh, seemingly unconscious, with a huge uh, green lizard-like monster uh, looking like it's about to, to eat him. So they take a few shots with their phasers, and which bounce off the beast, and uh, it seems impervious to their shots. Spock orders the security guards to, to fire the weapons at the creature's mouth, which appears to be the only uh, vulnerable area 
of the creature's body and fortunately it happens to work and the dinosaur monster runs uh, slightly and falls to the ground dead so they were able to kill it and save captain kirk so let's take a quick pause here craig and um, a couple things that i thought were very interesting uh, uh, during this introductory sequence is uh on the introductory page they have a splash page on this comic just like a lot of the prior issues and there's one line in particular that I don't think I've ever heard on a on a TOS episode uh, or in the comics. One of the one of the the, the people in the, uh, the 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 frame says, "My phaser is almost empty." Mm, that yeah. gives us an indication that the phasers can run out of power. I mean, I remember there was one episode of the original series, and it, the, the the title of it is escaping me. Uh, it was one of the episodes with a uh, another one of the fallen captains of another starship uh, finding like a fountain of youth type thing, or so he thought, and he was fighting off these uh, these kind of uh, I forget what the name of the, the 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 tribe or whatever it was was, but he was running out of I think he was running out of power in his phase, or so he was draining multiple power packs or something, but. I thought it was interesting that that the concept of running out of power in a phaser was specifically mentioned here. Yeah. Yeah. Did that did that stick out to you at all? No, not until you pointed it out. Oh, wow. very cool. Yeah. And I on the on the 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 spoiler splash page, it also has a picture of of Kirk yelling, "You dirty traitors, I'll burn you both" at McCoy and Spock, which I think was a pretty big giveaway to what's going to happen <laughs> yes in the issue i mean you know we, we talk about today's movie trailers having too much information in them and i think these splash pages that they have in these gold key comics are kind of giving away a little too much no I, I agree and i think at this point they're not even they're not even that effective in terms of getting you interested in reading the rest of the issue. It's just, it almost seems like they had a directive that they have to start every issue with an action beat. Oh, good, good thinking. I, I didn't even think about that. That's, that's, you know, that, that sounds very plausible to me because it, 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 it seems like they have to pick some kind of a moment from the comic uh, to entice the reader. And they're not necessarily always what I would consider um, I guess innocuous. They they sometimes they give away too much, mm -hmm. and maybe they're not. Some of them maybe aren't as interesting as others. Let's see what else. Oh, page two, panel three. They make a mention of one one of these weird uh, measurements of time, and they say thirty solar minutes. Mm. So we don't know exactly. Again, we we've seen these a bunch of times in prior issues, and even in the show itself that they have these bizarre measurements of time that we're not really sure. You know, I, I was earlier today, actually, I was watching the Doomsday Machine <laughs> over again, and, and Spock made reference to one solar day mm. as a, a, a unit of time to repair a system on the Enterprise. And so one solar day versus 30 solar minutes, are we, are we meant to believe that a solar day is the same as maybe 24 hours on Earth? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, that was uh, interesting that they keep that same nomenclature mm -hmm. in the comic they had on the show. Uh, let's see, page two, panel four, Spock has a pink tricorder and communicator, which I think is just a limitation of the inking <laughs> that yep. they were able to do mm -hmm. in the comic. But I always think it's kind of funny when they have funny colored uh, equipment or uniforms. Let's see, what else? Oh, page three, panel two, Scotty finally has his black hair. <laughs> yes. I don't know. Did you, did you did you pick up on that? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Very cool. And oh, uh, here's another really what I think is a really cool throwback to the show. Uh, page four, panel two mentions tribbles. Yes. Which is which is very very cool. Uh, and they also mention a couple of other things uh, that made me made me think briefly. They mention the gaseous beings of Madras Four and the silicon creatures of Century. But the silicon creatures of Century made me wonder why why didn't they pick the hoarder? Because the hoarder is silicon based. Yeah. <laughs> and they also mentioned the mental giants of Taos, which I, I don't know what a mental giant is. 
But um, the the I, the silicon creatures of Century, uh, you know, they've been making mention to things that happened on, on in TOS in a couple of prior issues, and it just kind of struck me as strange that they would mention silicon creatures uh, and not mention the Horda. Yeah, I I wouldn't be surprised if the writer was working from memory of of episodes that he had seen. And <laughs> if he had seen the Devil in the Dark, uh, oh, the that's intro, entirely he would have possible. It. Yeah, that's that's possible. We, we we really don't have a lot of background info on the writers, and and how what the writing process was behind these Gold Key comics. So I I guess, uh, you know, we're not uh, we we can only speculate yeah. on, on how these things were. Reached. So did any part of the the introductory part of this comic stand out to you? I mean, I just think it's really, really cool that the comic is once again um, uh, exploiting to its fullest potential the, you know, the possibilities of the of the delivery system for the story. And we get this huge creature that um, to do on the show would have been, would have, mm. been, you know, a great, great cost, probably involving stop motion and. Um, just effects that were outside the realm of what the show could do. So very, always very cool to see that. Uh, great, great point. I, I, I agree. And, and you have this, this for people who are listening who maybe haven't seen the comic, there's a, there's a large dinosaur-like monster here who's threatening Captain Kirk's life. And, and as Craig said, it's probably would have probably been nearly impossible to do on the original series without the use of, say, stop motion. Uh, animation so and with the budgets that we know they were stuck with on the original series i doubt this could have been done uh, at that time so pretty cool use of the 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 artistic work behind the drawing of this comic that they could uh, you know use this medium to present stories that uh, couldn't necessarily be done Mm -hmm. on television so anything else you want to say before we move on nope all right so moving along with the story here, uh, Captain Kirk returns to the Enterprise and uh, is seen by Dr. McCoy in sick bay. Other than a large uh, gash on his forehead and a concussion, he seems to be fine. McCoy orders him to rest, but in true Kirk fashion, he refuses and goes up to the bridge because he's got to make contact with Starfleet to return the communication that came in while he was disabled on the planet. And the Enterprise is ordered by Starfleet to escort an Omegan ambassador from Starbase Number 6. The mission seems to be critical since the Omegan Alliance uh, and the Federation is a bit on the shaky side. So the, uh, they, they caution Kirk not to provoke this ambassador at all because they're currently in a tug of war between uh, the... Uh, Starfleet and the Klingon Empire. So there's a bit of a tug of war between the two uh, for the loyalty of this Omegan race. So Kirk is told to be careful. And uh, the the ambassador is known for misinterpreting acts as uh, being unfriendly. So the Enterprise reaches Starbase 6. The ambassador, who happens to be a bald guy, is beamed aboard, and we know the history of these Gold Key comics and bald white guys. So it's kind of funny that we have yet another bald white guy. Yes. Uh, he makes he makes it known right away that he is not in approval of Starfleet and the ship. So Kirk and Spock, as they done on the show prior, uh, make every attempt to be polite and uh, get the Omegan uh, to his final destination. So... Uh, Kirk asks Scotty what the current speed is. Scotty answers that the ship is going warp two. And uh, Kirk, of course, uh, kind of lo- loses his cool a little bit here and uh, tells Scotty to increase t- to warp four. Uh, Scotty makes a little bit of a protest and uh, Kirk is a little bit short with him. So we're not sure if he's being short because he's feeling pressured uh, by this ambassador's presence or there's something else going on. Uh Kirk is a little bit uh, short with Scotty telling him that uh, he better do what he wants Kirk to do or else. So uh, Kirk proceeds to give the Omegan ambassador a tour of the ship and a, uh, unfortunately a crew member who is late for his duty uh, runs past and knocks down the Omegan ambassador. And despite his apologies, uh, Kirk orders the crew member into the brig. Spock is witnessing this scene unfold and suspects that something may be wrong with Kirk and confers with Dr. McCoy. 
So uh, McCoy is of the same opinion that uh, some the captain is acting abnormally. He's being a bit short-tempered and a little bit more domineering than normal, but we're not sure uh, whether or not this was a uh, this is a short-term effect from Kirk's experience with the dinosaur on the planet, or he's just feeling the pressures uh, with this ambassador and the, the tug of war between Starfleet and the Klingon Empire. So uh, McCoy and Spock are discussing the possibilities when Captain Kirk happens to walk into the room and overhears them, and he gets a little bit bent out of shape that his two most trusted confidants on the ship are plotting against him, and uh, he uh, issues a, a bit of a veiled threat and storms off. So we'll, we'll stop again here uh, to discuss the happenings here. Craig, anything stand out to you in this section? Yeah, I just think it's funny how it always um, there doesn't seem to be any consistency with who's actually at the helm. Re- oh, yeah. Interesting. Because we got Scotty there, mm-hmm. and then later in the issue, we're going to have Sulu. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah, that's true. So that, that kind of mirrors the show, doesn't it? Yeah, was there ever an instance on the show where Scotty was actually at the helm? Mm, I mean, I know we've helm? had various crew members jump in, but... Yeah, no, that's a good point. You know, you know what? No, it's a good point. I, I'm, I'm thinking in command, not at the helm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, maybe at the... Usually, I mean, we've seen Scotty in charge of the ship in the captain's chair. Yeah. But I don't know. No, it's true. Good point. I don't know if I've seen him in Sulu's chair uh, at the actual helm of the ship. So, yeah, good pickup there. Oh. Good, good pickup. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Not really. I mean, you know, I mean, so far this episode, uh, this issue um, is, is really just, um, it's all set up right now. Mm, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, page six, panel four. They, I, I wonder if this is the first pro- projected image we see from Starfleet Command. Oh, yeah. So we see somebody, you know, we've heard Starfleet Command mentioned in prior comics, but I don't think we've seen a face on a view screen. Mm-hmm. prior uh, as a transmission from Starfleet Command. So we're seeing somebody from Starfleet outside the Enterprise crew uh, actually uh, as a part of this issue. I thought that was oh, kind of yeah. interesting. Um, in page eight, there is, a, is a, an incident with the Omega ambassador that really feels like a lot of Troyes to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's being really difficult. You know, Kirk and Spock are trying their best to accommodate him, but it really feels like it feels just like the earlier parts of Alan of Troyes where um, they're just getting to know this very difficult alien. Totally. From a planet. And I, I wonder if uh, I probably I mean, this is the comic and this is kind of speculation, but I would think if this would have been an, an episode of the show, they could have easily harkened back to Kirk's experiences uh, with with the Dolman uh Alan from from totally. Troyes. So Totally. Yeah, and uh page 11 panel 1 Spock uh Spock says he's he's filled with worry. Mm. That seems strangely non-Vulcan to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that seems strange. And, and you know, of course that that occurs during Spock and McCoy discussing Kirk Kirk's condition and that really reminds me of something we've seen on the show many times with Kirk and and, and McCoy uh, kind of speculating about what's going on with Captain Kirk and why he's acting funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, anything else to to contribute before we move along? No, no. Some good observations there. All right. So soon after that, Kirk orders Mister Sulu to change his course. Uh, but Sulu, being the the good helmsman that he is, uh, lets Kirk know that the course will send the ship through the Gamma Maelstrom, which is what they call the Nightmare Pool of space from which no ship has ever survived. So we've seen something like this prior, uh, you know, star Trek five comes to mind, uh, mm-hmm. with the great barrier to which a no, sh- no ship has gone through it. No probe has ever returned. So we've got this, once again, this concept of this area of space that no one can possibly survive. And, uh, Kirk exclaims that they will be the first to survive it. Uh, we don't know if that's his attempt to impress this ambassador or or what he's thinking at this point. But the ambassador arrives on the bridge just in time to watch as the ship plunges into the B Gamma Maelstrom. So the opposing currents of the Maelstrom, uh, there. This is I thought was very interesting. So in the comic, 
they draw out the maelstrom itself and they have these very weird looking uh, goblins or, or some sort of creatures grabbing along onto the hull of the Enterprise, uh, threatening to tear the ship apart. So Kirk orders a full reverse. Uh, and of course, the ship is about to be torn completely apart from the forces of, of the vortex versus the ship's engines. And then Kirk decides to immediately change the thrust to a, a forward motion, pulling the Enterprise loose from the vortex. So the Omega ambassador is not happy with what's been going on and exclaims that the Klingons were right and the Federation is composed of unreasoned, reckless fools and storms out of the room. So we've got a little bit of an unpleasant situation here. Uh, Spock confronts Kirk about his behavior and Kirk gets angry and orders the ship to go ahead at full warp speed. Scotty lodges yet another protest uh, after the beating the ship is taken. Uh, he's afraid that the ship may not be able to withstand the, the high warp speed and telling the captain that it may kill everybody on board if he executes the order. Kirk draws his phaser and shoots Scotty in the back at the at a stun setting and poor Scotty has to be carried off the bridge into sickbay. So Spock, Sulu, and McCoy now are together there discussing the captain's actions. Spock says that, of course, it's their, now their duty to remove the captain who's become uh, incompetent in his mind. Uh, and using Starfleet regulations, uh, he orders a mutiny. So we're going to once again stop here. So let's see, page 12, panel 5. Uh, I, I like that they make mention of this specific area of space and like i said before this is something that the concept that we've come across in the show and in uh, the movies before so it's kind of cool to see this in the comic as well that there's these these bizarre areas of space kind of like the bermuda triangle uh, here on earth where you know no ship should go yeah, yeah. And the, the only thing that's a little frustrating here is you think there's this amazing uh, moment where Captain Kirk has once again pulled a rabbit out of the hat yeah. in terms of his ability to bail uh, you know, the ship out of dangerous situations. And then we learn it's not even him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, that that's that's good. You know, it, it, it seemed to me like um, this was one of those instances where you know, everybody warns Kirk that this is the wrong thing to do, but he knows better mm -hmm. and is able to safely pilot the ship through <laughs> this mm -hmm. maelstrom. But he he turns out to be kind of wrong here and has to use his uh, his ingenuity to just to free them from the maelstrom and not actually go through it. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. Oh, uh, page 14, panel one. Spock files the captain's log. Mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting that, you know, Kirk is still in command of the ship. He's not incapacitated, but Spock is filing the captain's log. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see what else. Um, seven page 17 panel three. Uh, we talked about Scotty defying Kirk's orders. I thought that was kind of cool. So, you know, Mr. Scott in the, the show, I mean, we've seen him be the hero many, many, many times and, you know, saving them from various malfunctions on the ship and, um, you know, just generally making things work. But I like the fact that they made his character bold here and, you know, defying Captain Kirk's orders, knowing that what he's ordering them to do is going to endanger the ship. So I love that they've maintained that Scotty character and the love for the Enterprise uh, yeah. in the comic. Oh, totally. Yeah, very, very cool. And, and is this one of the first times we've ever seen a phaser used on the bridge? Ah, I was just about to mention that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, Kirk is, in page 17 on the last panel, Kirk, where Kirk shoots at Scotty, Kirk is carrying a phaser while he's on the bridge. I don't think we've ever seen in the show Kirk with a phaser on his hip on the bridge. I think the only people we've ever seen on the bridge were red shirt security guards. Yeah. You know, I don't think we've ever seen any of the uh, the seven carrying a phaser on the bridge. So I think if you saw Captain Kirk on the bridge with a phaser, I think that would be an indication that something's not right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think you should immediately jump to the conclusion that something's wrong with Kirk. Uh, that may be something the evil Kirk would have done uh, in The Enemy Within. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. So anything before we move on? Nope. All right. Here we go. So uh, after spreading the word of their mutiny plan, the three officers uh, confront Kirk on the bridge and request that he remove himself from command. Of course, Kirk refuses and begins firing his phaser at his fellow crew members, yelling things like, uh, you rotten backstabbers, and you won't take me alive. So Kirk takes off and runs through the ship and eventually winds up getting into a firefight with Spock and McCoy, which is what was hinted at in the splash page earlier. And after a brief exchange, he is able to escape into the shuttle bay, steals a shuttlecraft, and escapes the Enterprise and flies off into space. Uh, the ambassador makes a reappearance and asks about uh, Kirk's escape, referring to it as another example of Federation competency. And Spock tells him that uh, the man that escaped from the ship was not James T. Kirk. So uh, this is interesting that Spock has jumped to the conclusion that this is not the the Kirk that he's known yes. uh, all of this time. So um, we'll, we'll stop again because we're getting kind of close to the end of the issue here. We'll, we'll just briefly uh, talk about a couple of these points. So uh, page 19, panel 1, I love the fact that it mentions Starfleet regulations. So mm -hmm. another throwback to the show. And we've seen, yeah. I don't know if we've heard Starfleet regulations in the comic yet, but... Mm -hmm. I like the fact that they cite Starfleet regulations as the uh, basis for asking the captain to step down. Yes. Uh, last panel on page 19, the turbo lift is marked elevator. <laughs> uh, you know, early on in the comic series, we made a, a point to talk about how the terminology differed from the show to the comic. I thought this was another one of those instances where, I mean, we've seen a lot of similarities in the last few issues, and I thought we were kind of past this point. <laughs> But uh, the turbo lift actually has a sign that says elevator on it. And um, let's see. Oh, and the shuttlecraft doesn't look like the Galileo from the show. Did you notice that? Oh, yeah. It looks like uh, it looks a lot more 70s inspired sci-fi. Yeah. So I, that that's um, really weird. They have the, the model for the Enterprise and they've been using that since issue number one. And it's always looked like the Enterprise. But... It's surprising to me that they don't know, or the artist doesn't know what the shuttlecraft looks like. Yeah, totally. That's a, a very good catch. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, the shuttlecraft occurred early in the series. I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure why it would have been a mystery uh, to them as to what the shuttlecraft looked like, but uh, anything else? Nope. All right. So Spock, uh, the ambassador, and uh, a couple of security guards beam down to uh, Beta 2. Uh, they find the stolen shuttlecraft abandoned there uh, on the planet's surface. So using his tricorder, Spock leads the uh, away team party to a cave entrance that's only a couple of feet away. They enter the cave, and they find that there's a concealed stairway that leads to a large cavern where they discover two Captain Kirks. And the big surprise, they find a bunch of Klingons there. So it is quickly surmised that there is a Klingon conspiracy. Uh, they find that the Klingons replaced Captain Kirk with a lookalike. And uh, Spock explains uh, how this whole thing went down. So the Klingons wanted to discredit the Federation and ensure that the Omegan people would side with the Klingon race as opposed to the Federation. And uh, they faked, the Klingons had faked the mineral deposits on the surface of the planet so that they could lure down an away team and kidnap the uh, captain via this whole plan with the accident and the, the dinosaur and all of these things. So the duplicate, captain, the duplicate Captain Kirk makes a break for it. The real Captain Kirk gives chase. And of course, they get into a fist fight. Spock arrives and isn't able to tell them apart until the fake Kirk asks Spock to kill uh, the other Kirk, which obviously is something the real Kirk would never do. So the Omegan ambassador sees the treacherous ways of the Klingons and vows to work with the Federation moving forward. So we have a very 
happy ending here, but it's also an ending that harkens back to uh, Whom Gods Destroy, the season three episode with uh, the famous Garth of Izar, which actually is a very interesting tie back <laughs> to the Axanar discussion we yeah. were having at the introduction to this episode, since Axanar was about the uh, the heroics of Garth of Izar. Yeah. So uh, really stands out to me. And this was that Spock having to decide between two Captain Kirks uh, is something that happened in that episode. So, I'm not sure if this was directly taken from that or if this was writer Len Wein's own parallel idea. What do you I think? I guess Brent? it was a, a, a coincidence. Hmm. Yeah, that, it's entirely possible. I mean, this is a kind of a sci-fi uh, construct we've seen in other series before this. So uh, it, it makes perfect sense that it's something that he could have come up with on his own. And again... Page 23, when the Klingons show up, uh, they're, somehow the Klingons are bald white dudes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what this artist has against bald white guys, but I think he's got a serious problem with white guys with no hair because all the villains wind up being that. Yeah, it's funny. I actually had to go back and read it and be like, oh, yes, they are supposed to be Klingons. Yeah, they don't look a thing like Klingons. Uh, they're Klingons in name only. Yeah. But um, so, you know, that that draws this issue to a close. And, um, you know, we 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 talk about the essential nature of these comics or the non-canon essential nature. And I guess by default, this has to be a an essential issue just for the introduction of the Klingons in the comic series. Yeah, I, I think you're I think you're you're right there, but it's. This was a frustrating episode because it seemed like it was an episode that I, I really appreciated what they were uh, attempting to do in terms of, you know, having um, Federation politics come into play and the idea of sabotage. But uh, the whole uh, the whole issue really just seemed like a setup for the big reveal at the end. There's really no meat to this issue. Wow. Yeah. You know what? I, I agree with that. I agree with that. It does seem like a, a long issue full of setup just for the big reveal at the end. So I think this is the first goal key comic we can say that about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I guess we have to look to the future and, and hope it doesn't necessarily de de define a pattern of what's to come. I, I do like the fact that they make several mentions to things in this issue that they don't mention before, especially Starfleet regulations. Uh, and I, I like the fact that they're trying to bring familiar elements and familiar aliens back in, although, you know, I just find it very, very strange that the author knew about Klingons, but the artist didn't know how to draw them. Yeah. So, I so strange. Almost, I can almost imagine he was frustrated when he when he saw the issue, you know, uh, after it was done. He's like, wait a minute. <laughs> what the heck's going on here? But uh, all right, you Craig, do you have anything else to add uh, before we close the episode? Uh, no. All right. So as always, thanks everybody for listening, and and thank you so much for all the great feedback we've gotten lately. The Christmas episode got a, a lot of great comments on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you again for everyone for listening, and of course, you can always find us on Twitter at ttt underscore pod on Facebook at facebook.com slash the tricorder transmissions and our own website the tricorder transmissions.com and uh, if you do go to the tricorder transmissions.com you may notice that we've made some changes to the website recently so uh, please enjoy those and, and and let us know what you think of them and uh, Craig and I will be back next week with another episode of the show and we hope to see you then <laughs> <laughs>